We pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our text for this morning's meditation is Psalm 26. I was encouraged when Dr. Timothy Seleska's commentary in the Concordia Publishing House series came out in 2020. It seems I am not the only one who stumbles at the language and the attitude of this psalm. Who can pray this psalm? Seleska writes, when I first read this psalm, I find myself trying to do for the speaker what the speaker asked God to do for him, vindicate him. I want to vindicate him because it sounds to me like he's boasting. The psalm opens, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. Prove me, O Lord. Try me, test my heart and my mind. To pray for vindication on the basis of one's own integrity or righteousness contradicts what we learn from Jesus and from St. Paul. It sounds like the prayer of the Pharisee in Luke 18. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. It flies in the face of what Paul's clear statement concerning the human condition in Romans 3. All have sinned and fall short to the glory of God. James Luther May comments, Surely it is incredibly presumptuous to pray that God investigate and vindicate us. Perhaps the only use we can make of Psalm 26 is to take it as a, a negative example an Old Testament contrast to proper prayer and faith. Or is there another way to read this psalm? Yes, there is. The early church often heard the words of the psalms, and particularly this psalm, first on the lips of Jesus. Prayed this way, Psalm 26 is, in the deepest sense, Christological. He is the only one, the only man who can say in all truthfulness, I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in Yahweh without wavering. This one man, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, the son of God, speaks to us these words ascribed to his forefather David. His integrity, his innocence is prophesied in the words of Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. As a sacrificial lamb, Christ died not for his own sins, but for the sin of another, for your sin and mine. His integrity, his innocence was prophesied in action. Exodus 12, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to his father's house. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Those physical lambs in the land of Goshen were the prophetic type, a tangible prophecy of what God would do. The antitype of the lamb, the fulfillment of that prophecy, came almost two millennia later as Pontius Pilate acted out the words of Psalm 26. Verse 6, I wash my hands in innocence. And all the people answered, His blood be on us! And on our children, you and I also stood in that crowd, calling down his blood on our heads, for we all have sinned. So they, so we took him outside the city, and there we crucified him on the 14th day of the month, just as Israel and Goshen had done. And from the cross, Jesus took on the words of Psalm 22 on his lips, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why could he not have also taken the words of Psalm 26 on his lips? 
Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted in Yahweh without wavering. If so, then the centurion facing him pronounced God's judgment. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Jesus' walk in integrity, his death in innocence, is the gospel, the good news of God's salvation. Jesus' innocent sacrifice cleanses us from all sins. You are clean. The filth, the stench of your sin has been and is washed away, washed in the water that flowed from his side, filling the font, forgiven and strengthened in the blood that also flowed, filling the cup of the Eucharist. You are declared innocent. Because Jesus did this, now we have entrance to Psalm 26. Now we can cry with the psalmist in verse 11, Redeem me, be gracious to me. Grammatically, the forms are imperatives, <laughs> as if we could command God. No, really they are a plea, a plea for mercy. A plea answered on Easter morning by the open tomb. A plea answered with water in the name of the triune God at the font. There you became a child of God when redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And as the redeemed, with the psalmist, we pledge, but as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Because Christ spoke this psalm, we can speak this psalm. Even now, even here. In the spring of 1525, the Reformation was still a dangerous and uncertain proposition. Blood had flowed. In the previous year, Caspar Tuber and Henrik von Stauffen had been executed for their confession. Perhaps even more troubling, the truth, the purity of the gospel was being splintered and distorted. Distorted by men, Karlstadt, Munzer, and others whose activities reached a climax in 1525. That year, on the 12th of May, shortly after the death of his protector, Duke Frederick, Luther took up Psalm 26 as the basis for his sermon. Translating the opening verse, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I am innocent. He takes it as a challenge. Do I hold fast the pure gospel? You have often heard that where God's word, the dear gospel, is preached and proclaimed, the devil does not rest or take a holiday. By force, murdering and slaughtering, and if that fails, with clever tricks, false teachers and lying prophets. In our day, as in Luther's, there remains disputes, enmities, and disunity between true and false preachers. We see it in the painful shattering of the Christian unity where the wisdom of man is given authority over the word of God. We see it in the secular, secularization of the church that marches to the beat of social societal norms. Luther declared, there is no one who will or can silence this dispute or resolve it except the divine word of God. So we look to heaven Sigh and pray God to be judged in such matters through the words of Psalm 26. Prove me, O Lord. Try me. Purify my kidneys and my heart. Verse 2, Luther's translation. It is a cry of confession. I know your word is pure, but the flesh still clings to me. I feel the temptation of pride, envy, evil lusts in my heart, but especially the subtle poison of ambition is just under the surface. Luther continues, quoting Augustine, Ambition is the mother of all heresies and sects. Close quote. So God sends trials to purify, to refine, especially the true preachers of the word. Paul prayed three times, right? Concerning that thorn in his flesh and God's answer, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. For the word in Psalm 26, which our ESV renders as test, Luther supplies purify. In the original, the Hebrew zarofa means to smelt or to refine by fire. It's a word associated with metalworking. 
It's the word in that great bass solo of Handel's Messiah, who can endure the day of his coming? For he is like a refiner's fire. Quoting Malachi chapter 3. The story is told of an inquisitive young man watching a jeweler at work, carefully balancing a crucible over an open flame. Into the crucible, he drops pieces of silver, pieces of broken or discarded jewelry, cutoffs, and filings from his workbench. As the pieces begin to melt, foreign materials surface and float on the top. As the temperature increases, they burn off. The fire purifies the silver, the jeweler explains, but you must be careful. If it gets too hot, it also consumes the silver. How do you know when to pour it off? When is it finished, the young man asked. When I can see my face, my reflection on the surface of the molten silver. So the Father purifies his word in the mouth of the Christian that we might trust solely on Jesus' merits and not our own. Jesus' innocent sacrifice purifies us from all sin. And purified, we can walk before God in righteousness. But it is a a foreign righteousness in a twofold sense. Foreign meaning external, because it comes to us from outside ourselves. And second, foreign because it is contrary to reason. We see both senses in our gospel reading for today. This shall never happen to you, we cry with Peter. A dead Messiah? No way, Lord. It doesn't make sense. But in God's economy of salvation, it is the only acceptable sacrifice. Because it is external righteousness, we also must lose our life in obtaining it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, will find it. This blamelessness, this purity that we have before God is the fruit of Jesus' cleansing redemption. A cleansing acted out in the upper room as Jesus rose from table, lays aside his robe, and starts washing feet. And again, as in today's gospel, the climax revolves around Peter. You shall never wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, Jesus explains, you have no share with me. And so Peter immediately what? He wants a bath. You are washed. You have been purified. You stand before God innocent, as Paul writes to the Colossians. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So, with the psalmist, we can say, I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Father Patrick Reardon summarizes, It is from the altar of repentance that we are rendered innocent, purged by a coal so ardent that not even the fiery seraph dares to take it except with tongs, recalling the prophet Isaiah's experience in the temple. Purified by Jesus' innocent sacrifice, we can walk before our God, and in doing so, we walk out into the world. This remains a great challenge. The psalmist includes a litany of those we are to avoid. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Verses 4 and 5. We are not, however, to be secessionists or hermits, as Luther explains in his sermon. Physically, I must be among them. This we must consider, but we should not accept their teaching. So this is a spiritual avoiding or fleeing when we separate ourselves from those with our heart, even though with our body we remain near them. Whoever handles pitch will soil himself with it. Close quote. It's a great challenge. It's also a great opportunity. Paul offers much wholesome advice, a litany of those of how we are to walk in our epistle lesson. Bless those who persecute you. Associate with the lowly. Repay no one evil for evil. Feed your enemy. Overcome evil with good. Walk because you have been declared righteous in Christ. Finally, to return to where we started, who can pray this psalm? 
Jesus can, and he did. Satan tested him in life, and he walked in innocence. His father judged him in a cruel death on the cross and pronounced his verdict in the glorious resurrection. His was a sweet-smelling sacrifice, acceptable and holy. Jesus' innocent sacrifice purifies us from all sin. And because Jesus did, you and I can pray this psalm. Pray it by holding fast to the purity of doctrine. Pray it by walking before God in Jesus' righteousness. Pray it by walking before the world as his children. Verse 12, my foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Would you please stand? <clears throat> 